Well, I always liked them from recordings, you know, and uh, uh, especially <laughs> one that is, uh, you know, uh, what, what, more, what do we call it? Uh, uh, it's off limits because <laughs> it's uh, his version of Chinatown where he does a vocal in fake Chinese, and it is hilarious. So he had a great gift for languages, and he really knew, I mean, he was fluent in Spanish, of course, but he knew other things as well, and even if he didn't know them, he could emulate the correct sound and make up nonsense words that fit, you know, that sound. So in Chinatown, he, he does this one chorus, which is, which is absolutely hilarious. Uh, I caught him a couple of times, but once was at a small, uh, small club in Midtown Manhattan around the Times Square area, which had zebra-striped banquettes. And I don't remember what it was called, but he was there uh, with a trio, you know, uh, and uh, there was space between the banquets and running to walk around. So they started playing How High the Moon. And then he went into a riff with the guitar. Like, ba do da da do do da da do da da do da da And he started walking around. And I swear, I'm not exaggerating. He must have played this riff endlessly. He certainly played it for at least five or six minutes, which sounded like an eternity because he kept repeating this thing, you know. That was all it was. And he had a big smile on his face, and it, it was like it, he knew that he was torturing us. You know? <laughs> so that's one thing. Another thing was uh, he was at Birdland, he was doing intermission, and he was by himself. He was playing piano. He's a very good piano player. I mean, he was a remarkable musician. And uh, he was playing piano, and then he had a, uh, it was not a, uh, a grand, it was an upright, and he had a glass of something alcoholic on top, and uh, among other things, he, you know, he, drink, he played, and then he would slowly get his right hand, move it up, sort of snake it up, until he got to the top and grabbed the class. And, uh, and it was such great theater, you know. I mean, he was, he was a, a wonderful showman. And uh, Lou Mel Morgan, who was a piano player who had worked with him, who worked for years in the village at this place called Arthur's Tavern, yeah. which was run by a very nasty old Italian guy who did like jazz and booked good people. But uh, I remember, I wasn't there when that happened, but my good friend, that Lorber, who sat in there a lot, told me about it. He said Charlie Parker, when he was on the way down, he came in uh, and, uh, you know, Arthur knew who he was for sure, he played there. So uh, he asked for, he didn't have any money, he asked for a drink. And Arthur refused him, and he said, you may be the great Charlie Parker, but you're just another bum to me. Uh, but he, was, he loved Brew more, and when Brew was trying to kick, which he did, uh, when Brew was trying to kick, his wife had thrown him out because of his habit. Uh, Arthur let him sleep in the basement, there was a basement there. He let him stay there, and he fed him and stuff. And I got to know, to know Blue then, and we would sit outside on the stoop. And he wasn't, he was off the junk, but he was drinking, you know, whatever. So he liked Ballantine's Ale, and they had these big bottles, like a quarter. So we would sit on the step, and we would talk. And he was actually from, he was from New Orleans originally, the only bebop tenor player from, from New Orleans. He was so good, bro. He was underrated, you know, among the Stan and, and, and Zoot. And uh, he was, 
I mean, nobody was on the level of Stan. I mean, he's a unique, but Wu was a beautiful player. So that was Arthur on his nice side. And uh, so why did we get on the, oh, because Lou Mel Morgan worked there. And Lou Mel and I was got to talking about, about uh, Slim because I knew he had recorded with him, so I asked him. So he said, there is a recording that he made, and I've forgotten the name of it now because I went and sought it out after what Lou Mel told me. He said they were, they were in Philadelphia, and uh, after the gig, uh, Slim was on his way home to his hotel, and a couple of guys attacked him and bumped him on the head and took his wallet, you know. So then the next day or two days after, they had a recording session, and Slim came up with this song, which was named, I think it's Fitzwater Street, that's the street where it was. So he has made up a song about this, and it's like, they, you know, they go, oh, Fitzwater, they bumped you on the head. And like that. <laughs> that's what he, it, overnight he wrote this song. I think that's, you know, it's wonderful. You know. Uh, I got to talk to him once and again, you know, like an idiot. Well, I was actually, uh, I was a little loaded then, you know. When was, uh, he was working at the Vanguard. And Clinton you know, Kearney, I, I, I started talking to him. So he said, let's go outside. He had his car parked outside. It was a beautiful, I think it was a Cadillac or a Lincoln. It's a big, long one, you know. And we sat there and talked. And he told me some things about himself. And, uh, you know, I mean, he was a delightful man. Fortunately, the Brits did a series of, of uh, you know, a videotape interviews with him, which was great. But he was a genius, you know, I mean, all the things that he did. Uh, and he was a great guitar player. Yeah. People don't realize that. I mean, he he was working opposite uh, Dizzy and uh, and Bird when they came to California to Billy Burke, and they had sort of a chilly reception. Now some dumb people are writers, you know. I mean, I, I mean, they say that you know that uh, they were successful Slim and Slam, you know, and that took away from uh, and that Dizzy and Bird resented that. That's absolute nonsense, and it's proven by the record they made together. Slim's jam, you know, where he says to he says to to Charlie, oh, you haven't got a read." He said, "McVeigh will trim one down for you." It's tenor play, <laughs> and the whole thing is he he you know he improvised all this stuff. There wasn't a script or anything. He was he was a brilliant man. He was wonderful. So, you know, people like that get underrated by the critics because they, you know, because they have a sense of humor and they do things that they consider commercial or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah but popularity yeah. is the kiss of death it's in a some circles. Yeah, yeah. Here's another one, poppity, poppity, pop, go the yeah. motor circle. <laughs> but Leo Watson... They're good records. Leo Watson, to me, is the greatest of all scat singers, because he's the most musical. Now, they are musicians who scat really nice, you know, no question about it, Ray Nansen, and Louie, for yeah. Christ's sake. But of people who are singers and who scat, Leo was the best because he scatted like a musician. And there's a record he made, you know, Red McKenzie, who singing, was almost the exact opposite, you know, because he sang like what he was. He was an Irishman, and he had a kind of sentimental streak. And he, you know, he. Well, we can talk about Red some other time. But no, uh, he Red recorded Red. with uh, with Leo. You know, he he had this. He, Red was a good businessman, and he, you know, he was sort of enterprising. And he got them a record date, and so he was on it. Uh, 
And uh, it says, you know, what the, he played. He played good calm. I mean, on Hello Lola, and, uh, yeah. and it's good. You know, he, he plays. I think Eddie Kahn and North Tucker said he played better on the common than guys played on the trumpet. But uh, uh, on uh, on a thing they do as long as I live, Leo takes a chorus on that, a Scott chorus, and it is so beautiful. It matches any top instrumental solo that I know of. I mean, you could you could transcribe it and, and play it. You know. And I have this thing in it. It's never going to happen, but uh, <laughs> I, I want to make a I want to make a record singing. <laughs> and uh, what I would do would be to to copy that thing of Leo's. By having it on a, you know, on on headphones and just singing along with it, because I think everybody should know that it, it's gorgeous. So he was, he was with Gene Cooper for a while. We recorded with him. He was with Artie Shaw for a minute, and uh, but he never got the recognition that he should have. And he was a good drummer too. We started talking about him as a drummer. Uh, so I mean, he he was verbally, uh, actually. I mean, he was wonderful. I mean, could have been could have been a great poet, <laughs> but he had a lovely sense of humor. And I wish I, I had met him. I would have liked to have met him and talked to him. Uh, there's something you know, a late one that he did. Leonard Feather did a session with him. I think in the black and white and, and book. Vic. Yeah. On signature, yeah. Sunny Boy, Jingle Bells, uh, Tight and Gay, yeah. and the the Snake Pit. I yeah, think. yeah, great yeah. Artists. Snake Pit is great. Tight and Gay is a funny title. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure it meant then what it does now. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, uh, that word has been robbed of its original meaning. <laughs> uh, anyhow, yeah. There's one thing where he, where the name, there's something about a round table and Mabel, and he says, hello, round Mabel, on the side. <laughs> oh, no, Leo, I, I wish I could have, could have seen him. I took, there was, there was a, a video of Little, well, it's originally a movie, of him with Slim playing drums. And I took a couple of close-ups from the uh, from my phone, you know, and uh, of him on the drums. He's a good drummer. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's the. Uh, uh, we were going to talk about Slim, but that's about you know what I what I told you is is, is about you know what I have to say. Let me take uh, you back to Red Mackenzie for a minute. <clears throat> yeah. I never got to meet or see Red. But I got to, we, did we ever talk about Eddie Condon? Yes. So we talked about Eddie. So you know that they were, you know, they were really close friends in Chicago and it was due to, you know, McC Mackenzie Condon, Chicagoans. It was, it was uh, Red who got the record date for them and stuff. But uh, he was, you know, I mean, he was a talent spotter too. I know he made some very nice late records for Milt Gable, Commodore. And there is one song that he does, which the, he's the only one who recorded it, as far as I know. And Milt told me, I did a long interview with Milt when I did this biggest thing that I ever did in my life, was doing the notes to the complete Commodore box. I forget how many records there were, but. Probably 66. Something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Whitney Balliot said something nice about me when he reviewed that. He said that, I forget what exactly he said, but he said that, that I was, he, didn't, he said that I, I was so good at this particular kind of writing liner note, which he called a hybrid form of writing, you know. Um, but to be singled out by Whitney, you know, was a great compliment. But anyway, in this, uh, uh, Mill told me that there was a special song of his, this is nobody else has recorded it, 
uh, where he did the verse and Milt said that he stupidly didn't record the verse because the verse really sets up the tune and Milt said that was one of the you know most moving things he'd ever heard Red do so you, go to, you know it's a 10 inch 78 so you can see why he didn't do it but he really blamed himself for not having done it. Is that through a veil of indifference? There's one of the Commodores is a song, as you say, that no one ever else ever yeah. did, called Through a Veil of Indifference. Yeah, that's it, Through a Veil of Indifference. Milt said there was a beautiful verse to that that he didn't record. So I don't think, God knows whether anybody else knows it, whether the song is published. It probably is published. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Red, I mean, on this, uh, as long as I live with Leo, I mean, the contrast between Red sings first and then Leo, the contrast is not to Red's advantage. Because <laughs> he sounds, you know, he had this, you know, so he sounds corny compared to Leo, but he was really very good at what he did, you know. He was an Irish tenor, he had a lot of feeling. And he was very smart, but of course with the, with the uh, bill blowers, they were tremendously successful. I mean, they sold what nowadays would be called, you know, there were million sellers in the 20s uh, with this group, which was Red on, on the comb. and. Uh, Jack Bland on guitar, who was a very good guitar. Nobody knows when Jack Bland died. There's no death date for him. So anyway, uh, and somebody else, I forget. Was it, 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 Jack it, it, Slevin. Yeah. And sometimes there's a percussionist named Josh Billings. Oh, Josh Billings, who was, Josh was a real, character. He was he was something else aside from a musician. I forget what he was. Was he a painter or something? I don't know. But he was a legendary character. Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe did Eddie Lang sit Eddie in? Eddie Lang was on yeah, some of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Trumbauer was on yeah, the did, early ones? Yeah, they did one together, yeah, session. So Red, you know, and but but he was a good he was a good entrepreneur, you know. He was early on 52nd Street, and he was instrumental in 52nd Street in getting people gigs, including, you know, there was, everybody thinks that 52nd Street was so wonderful in terms of integration, but it really wasn't. He got black guys gigs yeah. in 52nd Street. And, uh, so he was a good guy, Red was. Yeah. Uh,